Okay, well, I'm Brooke Burton, and we are here in the beautifully renovated James Castle House, and I am so excited to welcome you to the very first Creators, Makers, Doers Live, brought to you by the Boise City Department of Arts and History, and in part by West Elm Furniture downtown. And I am happy to be here with Jim Talbot, a local photographer and artist. And I am very happy to be here with everyone who came in person and as well to people who are tuning in online to our Facebook live stream. Welcome, everybody. <clears throat> if you don't know, the Creators, Makers, Doers series began as an online blog where you can still go and you can read interviews with artists like Jim and hear their story in their own words, and more importantly, if you're like me and you're visual, you can look at photographs of their beautiful workspaces. You can see their studios, look at artwork, and see some of their process if you're visual like that. That reminds me, next month, back here, we will have painter Chris Binion. And when I was looking back through those interviews, Jim, I think your original interview was 2015. Really? So that's yeah. like three and a half or more years ago. And as mentioned before, I have some questions prepared, and then we're going to open it up to questions from you guys, and as well as from our live stream. Anyone that's um, out there watching, post your comments and post your questions, because we are listening. We want a chance to respond to your questions as well. So with that, Jim, you are originally from Ohio. Yes. And thankfully, you were on a career um, in sales, but you took a detour and you followed a passion in photography. Yes. We are so glad you did. Well, thank you. Yeah. I am too. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. taught for 16 years at Boise State University yes. as adjunct professor yes. in photography. I read a comment today on Facebook that said that your perfectionism in the dark room is something to be admired and something to be respected. So there's that. But uh, I really want to know, did you ever stop and take a look back at that sales job you left behind? Well, I had three sales jobs and all of them were wonderful. They were absolutely wonderful. Really? And had I not gotten into, you know, photography, I, and that was a whole accident thing, I, um, I probably would have retired with one of the companies. They were, I worked for 20th Century Fox and I worked for them for about, I think, three years. And then I went to work for MCA Records and I worked for them for about five or six years. And then the last 14 years were spent with Random House Publishers. So I mean, they were great jobs. And, uh, but this is by far the best that I've ever done. I mean, what I've done since I was, uh, well, since I started when I was 40. So, so it was definitely a transition. Isn't oh yeah, oh yeah. <clears throat> it's a great ride. So. For people that may not know, um, like when I think of Jim's work, I think of a series of photographs that I would describe as environmental portraits. Photographs of people in their spaces, surrounded by their stuff. And what always strikes me is that they're looking like right at the lens or right at you, maybe, behind the lens. And I know from working with film, you remember film, and even digitally, you've got to sift through like a lot of shots to find the one you're looking for. What are you looking for? Well, you know, when, you, when you're doing that, when you're setting somebody up, I purposely had them look straight into the lens. And um, when you're doing that, I, I, I tell them to look in the lens. I said, I would always tell them to look like you normally look. And, and, and they would, wonderfully, they would, they, would, they would do that. And so what I would do is I, obviously I had the camera in front of them and I would make 30 exposures and everybody got 30 exposures. And for the most part, they, they were, were um, wonderfully accommodating. They did what I requested and I just went through and just shot one after the other, 30 photographs. And I used, most of the time, I used medium format film. So there were 10, 10 uh, exposures to the film. I take it out. I put another roll of film in and I shot three rolls of film. And there was always one that was the, the photograph. How did you know? Uh, I'm just psychic. <laughs> no, it, it just, it always worked out that way. Now maybe if I, 
maybe if I had taken 40 photographs, there would have been, there still would have been maybe one or two, but taking 30 images, you use, there was always one that was good, one that was good to me. So I'm gonna give Jim a hard time because I went back and read his interview from 2015 in which he described himself as not a technical guy. But you're someone, like we said, had a perfectionism in the dark room. Then you switch to digital photography, which anybody knows that sorting through those digital images and doing that process can be maddening. And then, more recently, you've switched to video and editing video on the computer. So I want to know what that process has been like and changing with the technology. When I did Photoshop, Photoshop was very hard for me. It's probably the most complex of all the Adobe software. And um, it was, it was really, it was really, it was really difficult for me. And now I look at it and it's very, obviously very simple. But I, I worked through that. I, 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 I took the course up at BSU and I spent hours, hours in the, in the photo lab that they had. And um, I had Larry McNeil as a teacher, and I think I, well, I, I drove him crazy too. <laughs> but, but once I got it, once it, once it sunk in, then it, you know, it's easy. And, um, and then from there, um, I got into video, and I had, um, I have another friend in the communications department who teaches, vi uh, teaches video, and, um, he, I, I had his wife as a student, so obviously I got introduced to him, and and he is he's wonderful. He's just absolutely wonderful. Well, he took me through a basic course in using Final Cut Pro 10, and then from then on, you know, you just get a, a general, it was like a general walkthrough, and then you can just you know look up and look at the tutorials and do and, and yeah, and but just come not everybody together. can do that. That's what I'm talking about. You being a technical guy, because I go over there and I him in photography, and he shows me his setup, and there's like this keyboard with weird symbols on it. And I'm like, did this come with the, and it's special for video editing, and not everybody can just go on and continue to teach themselves from tutorials. Well, that keyboard is complex to me too. I never okay. use it, but it keeps the keys right. plain. But uh, it, it, there's, um, there's a fine line of sameness that, that runs through it all. Uh, Editing video was very similar to, you know, um, I use Final Cut 10. Final Cut 10 is very similar to Adobe Photoshop. So there's, there's a lot of carryover. There's a lot of carryover. Building on Right. Itself. And I, you know, I, uh, I, you know, I look at, when I'm able to, there are a lot of tutorials on, um, on YouTube, and then I go and I have also tutorials that I've that I've purchased, like from Mac Pro Video, and, and they're you know they're for um, they're for the person of even of lowest common denominator intelligence, and so I you know I fit right in. I can follow them, but after a while, when you're working with them, you it, it's like an intuitiveness. You know you 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 just sort of know how the software thinks. And then you can just basically start doing stuff. And it was the same with Photoshop. I think Photoshop is hard. Photoshop was hard. I think you're a technical guy. I'm just well, going to put that out there. I'm uh, so on the lower echelon. This is, we talked stuff. about, um, we met on Sunday just kind of prep for this. And we found out a pet peeve of yours is when people talk about the process of art being magical. Right. Yeah. Can you t share some of what we were talking about on that? Well, um, like the uh, mysticism about making art. Right, and it's some great, you know, um, it falls from the skies and it's mystical. And, and to me, um, I'm, I'm not one of those people. Um, I'm just, I look at myself as a basic guy and, um, you know, I, I do it because I like to do it. And the reason that I do it is that I get high when I do it, okay? If I did that cleaning toilets, I probably would be cleaning toilets and talking to you about doing that here. But I get high, I get into my feelings, I get a sense of elation. And it's all about, for me, it's all about doing it. Once I get it done, I mean, it's gone, I forget about it and, and whatever. 
but it's all about the process of doing it and getting into my feelings and I feel um, I feel a sense of elation when I do it. It's just a wonderful, wonderful feeling. And I, um, <clears throat> for, for, about 40, for about 40 years I was a drinker, okay? And that's how I got into my, I could get into my feelings. I was um, maybe, feel, we might say feelings impaired. So I drank and the drank gave me a, um, it, it gave me a sense of elation. All right, but the doing this work, doing doing the actual you know creative process, and I can get into my feelings today. I get the same elation that I did with booze, but I don't get DWIs. <laughs> you know, I don't fall down. I don't get into fights. You know, so um, it's a lot safer. Really. Yeah, it's a lot safer, but it's a, it obviously it's also a lot more rewarding. But I love the process of doing it. That is awesome. Yeah. Um, that made me think of when you were saying you finish the creative process and then that feeling of elation goes away and you forget about it. It made me think it's time for another fix then. Right. <laughs> Sounds like an, um, an exactly. obsession or a compulsion then to get that back again. Yeah, it is. It is. And I've been going now, um, it's probably been about three weeks without a fix, so I'm, I'm starting to get nervous. All right, and uh, it takes longer. It takes longer to do it um, to, to, to find a project when you're. Um, I think when you're doing video than it did when I was when I was doing photography. Yeah, but, that, I have so many things on that I want to ask. Right. Like, uh, how would you compare your photography to now? You're just you're just starting in video and you're right. all fresh in it. How would you compare the two? For you, for you, not the two mediums. Oh um, well, I, lo I love I love I love the photography, and, or the, I love the photography when I was doing it, and I love the video now that I'm doing that, and um, it's there's a carryover from photography into video. There's a there's a big carryover into it, and and also there's a lot that is not a carryover. And so when you're when you're when you're working with with you know when you're working with photography you have one image and you have to you know it would take me probably and I didn't work eight hours a day on it but it would take me probably on a on a good time it would take me five months to do a print and that is in in Photoshop okay and then because I kept going over it and going over it and over it and over it and over it and changing it and by the time I um, by the time I um, um, got to the end of it, I knew the I knew I was at the end because I, basically speaking, I got so sick of it I wanted to vomit. I couldn't stand. I literally couldn't stand to do it anymore. And usually that coincided with my gut told me it's done, it's over with. Well, with film, um, with video, I spend a lot more time. I I, I do. Right now I'm doing short ones. I was told to do short ones because you'll make just as many mistakes with the short ones and therefore you can get through your mistakes faster and then, you know, get on to you the You learn more. faster. You learn faster. And so that's basically what I do. But even the short ones will take me a, um, they'll take me a month to do. And that's, I'm, we're talking short, we're talking 60 seconds. Okay, so you 60 just, seconds to do or the film is 60 seconds? No, you, it, the, the 60 <laughs> seconds, you basically, they can be anywhere from 60 seconds to a couple of minutes, but they'll take me maybe four months, could take me anywhere from three to four months to complete that. Because there's a lot more things you have to do in video. So, um, and there's a lot more mistakes that can be made. So. Basically, you have a number, of, you have, you know, different frames, and when you switch, you switch from one scene in the video to another scene, like we, we would switch from you guys watching um, Brooke and I here, and if there's, um, the light may change, so you have to make the light the same way because it totally, you know, you have to make everything, has got to match. match. Everything has to match. And there's easy ways to do that. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not difficult, but it, it just takes, 
It takes it takes a long longer time, and I'm not an experienced editor, so I go along, and I'm sort of. Um, well, when I first began, it was like playing chopsticks on the piano, and I had to stop and look up how, where the note was between hitting the notes, okay? So it was very slow. Now I can do it a lot faster, but it still takes me, if I start to speed up and do it real fast, I make bad mistakes, and then I gotta go back and I gotta redo it. So I, I do, and, and I'm not doing this professionally, so I just, you know, I take my time and, and I'm, I'm not on any time schedule, so I did take my time. But. So I wanna ask about how people might think if you've got a camera and you're pointing that lens right. at your subject, right? You're finding a subject that you're looking for something or finding something that's separate from the self. What would you say about that? About pointing at a subject versus like I'm not getting the question. Well, the question is, is the work a reflection of yourself, even oh, though yeah. oh, the yeah. subject oh, yeah. is not you? Oh, yeah. Like how? Even in the photography, I don't know if any of you people have seen my photography, but every subject in that photography is part of me. And everything I do in my videos is part of me. Everything is an overlay of me. A number of years ago, I, one of the guys that I, I, I liked his work was Richard Avedon. And um, he, did a, he, did a, um, he did a series called The West, which before he died was one of the finest series he ever did. And there's a, there's a PBS documentary on that, and he's sitting in, in, a, in a restaurant talking to one of the subjects. And, uh, he said, and he says to her, he says, you know, he said, when I... When I, when I photograph you, he said, it's not you. He said, it is my interpret, interpretation of you. And he said, my interpretation is, 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 is a result of all my life experiences, which are up here. And so, and the subjects look quite different from people you'd see if you saw these people in normal everyday life. And mine are too. So, um... So basically, I you know that's always that's that's God. I I probably read that about forty years ago, and I've always remembered that. So basically, when I'm doing my work, it's all a reflection of me. It's all a reflection of my life experience. So, like, if we took, if you and I had the same subject, our photographs are still going to be exactly it'd be exactly different, completely different. Right. I'm I'm very much into the, um, and I get a. a I'm very much into the dark side of human nature, and um, I've experienced a lot of it. And I'm just—I get it. It's sort of like I get when I when I get into doing these things, as I mentioned before. I get—I get really—I get my my feelings get wonderful, and they just almost ovulate, and I <laughs> and I and I get just ex I get excited, and. Uh, so, but it's basically on the really dark side of life. Okay, like what kind of dark sides? Uh, we talked about the mask, too. The mask? Well, um, sometimes the face we put forward is like a mask, oh, and that's uh, like a dark side. Have anybody here seen the Thelma series? Yeah. Thelma, yeah. All right, the Thelma series is one, probably the first one I did. And basically, it shows this woman who has built her home. It's, it's, it's sort of su it's southern poor, and it's a home that's a shrine to herself. And it's, it's no other home that I've ever seen like this home. And so anyway, I worked with her for a year, but we went through and we, we did the series very, very, um, very slowly. But when you look at her and you look in that series, you will see that... When, when you see the series of pictures, it presents, um, it, pre it presents how she wants to be perceived by people versus what's underneath. And it's there in the series. And where that's autobiographical, it's autobiographical in my life because my parents were exactly like that. They had a persona to the public and then the other persona that I knew was way different 
than the persona that they had to the public. So again, that's coming from me. Okay, so and, and that just sort of came out. Yeah, I think subliminally that will when one one does art, that will come out. It just comes out. It's, it's, again, it's my life experience. Was there a moment when you? So you said it come out subliminally. <laughs> subliminally, was there a moment when you were like, "Oh, that, that's me, that's my story." Well, well I looked at Thelma, and as I said, I spent a I spent a year working with her, and uh, that one I looked at. Um, I looked at it and said, "You know, um, what is this? This has got to be about me. What is it about me?" And then when I looked at it a couple of times, that's what that's what I came. You know. Was and I'm and is like and again in my feelings in my gut. It says you're totally right on that. Well, well, how much later was it? Was it like? Well, maybe a year or two later. Or oh, whatever. just a couple of years later. Right, but I don't do that with everything. Now, uh, in, uh, in a couple of the videos that I use, uh, um, there's one that uh, yeah, it's some of the some of the the videos that I've done. I'm I'm on a real. Um, um, they, they deal with spousal abuse, okay? So there was a lot of physical abuse in my family when I was, when I was a kid. So that's, that's another subject with me, and that's, that's very conscious. Um, and then there's one that, uh, it's called, um, it's called Match Game. And it's, and it's also, it's, it's about what I just said, but it's also about, um, I remember when I was selling, when I was with Random House, I was, in Louisiana, and I came out of the 7-Eleven one morning with a cup of coffee, and I heard, uh, I heard the, um, I turned on the radio, and there was a news, and the cops had been called to a house in Monroe, Louisiana, and the, um, um, the woman had waited for her husband to go to bed, and when he went to bed, he, she, she put five bullets in his head, you know, and that's right up my alley. So I was listening <laughs> to that. And, uh, and basically it, it had been, you know, abuse over a long period of time and she obviously just snapped and she finally, you know, she'd had it. And then it was like the cops told her, you know, they came to the house and they'd been, they'd been called many times before to this household and they came to the house and, um, you know, they told her, don't worry about it, you did good, we'll take care of it. Wow. I'm not, that's not an exact quote from them, but that's about what it amounted to. Wow. So, so I've seen, I've been watching some of your videos, and to me they're pretty distinctly different from your photographic work because right. exactly what you said, that the photographs were working from a um, uh, subliminal state. I feel like the videos are more um, directed from up here, like it's more direct from your experience and not subliminal. Right. Well, when I do the videos, like for example, um, it's like when I did the photographs, I would connect with somebody. I would see somebody, I would, there would be, there's like an invisible connection. A spark. I would, a spark, exactly, a spark. And I would usually approach that person and say, hey, you know, I told them my name and what I do. And if you, you know, you tell them you teach college, that gives you, that gives you a lot of instant credibility. And so you know, I said, I'd like to do a portrait of you and I would compliment them and so on and so forth. And usually they would let me do it. And so that, that everybody got a free portrait. Well, it's the same thing with, it's the, same thing with the videos. Um, I, I see, like for example, I see, um, um, for example, a house. And, and with the one you saw, there was a house. There's a house up by Placerville that's totally gutted. It's just gutted, and it's you walk through. There's like you walk through a bed of glass, and everything is destroyed. And um, it, I, I just I really connected with that house, and I I sort of like things that reflect abandonment. And so I, I just I just was eating away. So I, I went up. Um, we went up there one my partner Judy back there she and I went up and uh, we and I said well, okay we're going to do a video here and we're going to do a video about a guy that abused his wife and he's back coming back now to kill her and so anyway 
um, Judy, Judy is, um, has very na wonderful natural abilities to act. And uh, so anyway, we went up there and we shot a couple of scenes. And then I, you know, I put this scene together and he comes back and he's gonna kill her. And, um, and then at the end, you know, she kills him, blows him away. But it, it's all, it's, I don't know, what's it, about three or four minutes, I think. And, but it's all, it, I have to do things that only one man can do, because I don't have a crew with me. So that's sort of limiting. But I mean, so that, that house led to me putting this story together around the house, but that's what I've been doing now. Yeah, ex yeah. Um, what was the question I had about that, about the video? Um, I didn't know, so Jim, we had written up a really nice professional bio of Jim, and then I kind of wanted to hear something like that in his own words. Would you read this? Sure. So, um, this is something that I felt was really poetic and um, <laughs> honest, and it really helped me understand your work better. All right. Well, okay. It's called, it's called The Backdraft Odyssey. My first bar stool, I sat on it at 15 years old while doing plain geometry. Booze, exploded feelings. I climbed down off it at 40, double crossed and defeated. My childhood was spent obsessively watching Saturday matinee movies. They let me feel. Without them, there would have been a pitch black void within. Present time, sobriety, what now? There are no voids. Time used to guzzle was turned into hours spent learning photography, a lust for life. Feelings were instilled. They led me on a phantasmagorical spiritual journey. Trust and follow. The best mentors were put before me. I glommed on and am still glomming. My photographs and now videos skirt the dark side of human nature. It is about 20% of our psyche. Unattended, it can foment with a small from a it can foment from a small boo boo to a malignant growth, and that was it. Do you think some of the videos could be like revenge fantasies? Well, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, um, yeah. There's another one. Uh, um, there's another one I did. I like. It's called Balls to the Wall. And it's about, Judy plays in that one, it's about a female vigilante that, that goes around and these guys that, that um, um, these guys that go around and abuse women, she's, a, a vigil, she's sort of like the Charlie Bronson and she takes care of them. And so, but I have a real thing about that, about, well, about the, um, you know, I, I, I know emotionally about spousal abuse, so, it's a big thing with me, and uh, I. Um, so that's you know that's what I'm working on now. Eventually, it'll it'll change. It'll go into something else. But it'll pro they're probably all will be on the dark side. Well, that's uh, one thing I was going to ask. You said it's been three weeks since your fix, <laughs> art making fix. So I was wondering if you had something you knew you were ready to tackle next, or no, no, no. if you know what that spark is, and I've you got, know. I've got to take the magnifying glass and go out and. Well, so how Look. do you do that? How do you find the spark? You talk about going to the magnifying glass. You don't mean like an actual magnifying no, glass. No. Well, you know, I mean, um, for I did this, I did this video called Hostel Hostel, okay, and we were going. Judy and I were taking a ride down to Marsing, and we were riding down to Marsing, and there's this old stone home, that's again, it's like the place in Placerville. It was sort of gutted. And I just, you know, the bells went off. And so anyway, I got permission to go in there and photograph. And so then I t t took and I made a, a picture called Hostel Hostel about this place where, you know, um, where there are these, I, I get these, these creatures out of, um, they're off of YouTube. These different, some of these different creatures and I, and I, and I green screen them and I, then I put them in the, well, they're green screened on YouTube, and then I up their characters, and I had them walking through the house and doing what they're doing. So, but it's usually an object or or something. I I I well, I would like to eventually find somebody like I people like I did for my 
for my photographs and then do small documentaries around them. I would so watch that. Yeah. <laughs> what I heard partly there was that sometimes inspiration comes to you when you're out driving around. Yeah, I do a lot of that. Driving around and walking around. I would really like to see you do small documentaries of, on people. I've got to find people to do them on. Did you have a hard time getting people to agree to be photographed? No, no, no. I always, uh, the, one, the one thing that's key to doing that is you compliment the person. Okay, let's pretend I'm a person and you want to photograph me, and how would you do that? <laughs> this is role playing. This was not in the script. Um, so it was, what would... <laughs> is that minutes? Okay. Um, I would... Uh, I'd be like, hey, why have you been sitting there for so long staring at me? I would already, I, I, I would have it, I, if I would see you, okay, I would, um, um, I would ask you if I could photograph you in the same way that I, um, that I did to the other, like I just mentioned to you before a couple of minutes ago. And one of the things that, how I probably would do you, have you seen my photographs, right? Oh yeah. Okay. Other, other, yeah. Well, um, I probably would do. Um, did you ever see the Grand View Motel? No. Did you ever Disappointed see? Disappointed to say. And, uh, I probably would make you very sexual. Okay. You're welcome. <laughs> no, in, a, in a in a real in a real sort of appropriate, raw here's, way. Here's the question though. <laughs> Let's go back to the other question, which is if you said, hey, can I photograph you? And I said, I don't know, why? What for? Well, what I'll would you, you say? I'll tell you the same thing. I mean, I would, <laughs> okay. I, I, I mean, I mean it. I don't, I'm not, I'm not right. pulling your, you know, pulling And then I would have to think about that and I'd come back and I'd be like, okay, well, show me your work. Maybe we, did people ask to see photographs first? Like, well, what do you mean? No. I don't. I pull out my college ID. I said, "Hey, I teach college." You know that. Just oh, that, I forgot about that. That's right. It's that um, if you're a college professor, then you've got that level of authority and validation. There's there's a a picture I did called the Grand View Motel, and the woman that that is the was was the um, she was the uh, the subject of the movie. She lived in uh, up on. Um, Harrison Boulevard. You know the big house on Harrison Boulevard with the lions? Oh yeah. She lived there, okay? And we were doing stuff around the house and there was, they were all sanitary pictures, every one of them. And she, she's quite a, like you, she's very attractive. And so I, um, so she said to me, and she was dressed and she dressed very appropriately and you know, so she said to me, um, she said to me, well you know, she said, uh, in case you haven't noticed, she says, I do have cleavage. And I said, I noticed. And she said, well, let, let me show you. And she went upstairs and she put on this gown that showed cleavage. And I said, you know, and it's, it's it, 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 was, it was, you know, really a nice image. So I said, okay, so there's a place that one of, one of when I was a student at BSU, one of the students, took a picture of motels around town and there's a place up on Federal Way called the Grand View Motel. And I've always obsessed on that place, at least I did back then. So I thought this, this is the Grand View Motel. It's a perfect place. So she had a big pink Cadillac, like a 1957 Cadillac. So we got in, she got in the dress, we took her up to the Grand View Motel and I had her back up the car, and she's she got the big fins coming out on her side, and the big the sign called the Grand View, and there she was in her dress with the cleavage. Okay, it's a very appropriate picture, but so uh, you took somebody from Harrison Boulevard and you drove them up to the Grand View. Right. Okay, I right. see. Right. All right. Right, and you have one that's um, that's on your site of the one in the the, the, the former portrait in the. In the, in, the, in the black dress, that's a bitchin' photograph. I'll in the city hall? 
I, or on the website? It's on the website. Okay. It, it's, it's in a black dress. And yeah. It's black and white. And it's pretty intense. That's a great photograph. They're all but I, photos. But I would, uh, you know, that's, that's probably the way that I would do that. You know, there's, there are a couple of women that I did, and uh, she, um, oh, you know, they have, sort of, they have erotic overtones to them, but they're very appropriate. I, I, I don't do, I'm not interested in doing anything, you know, beyond that or exploit or I would say your like photos that. are very subtle. I think that yeah. your videos are a lot more right in your face. There's a lot of aggression right. there. And that's why I'm curious to see. But they're about see. me, you know, they're yeah. about me. Well, you're in a different phase. Right. I, we have a couple more minutes. I have one question because we talked about um, the process of feelings and the process, you know, that um, statement you wrote about um, being a kid and burying yourself in TV because that's yeah. where you were allowed to have I, your feelings. I feel, yeah, I have feelings, yeah, yeah. Um, we also talked about in that process, you referenced self-actualization. Right. So what is that? Um... I read about self-actualization. There's a book called The, um, the Family by Jeff. Oh. Did I go? I, one minute? Oh, I don't know what she's still. Yeah, you're good. I'm good? Okay. There's a, there's a thing by, um, a book called by John Bradshaw, and he talks about self-actualization, where you, you, you actualize yourself by totally depending on your feelings. And that's what I, that's what I wanted to do. And so I spent a lot of time being able to do that so I could run on my own machinery. How does art play into that? Um, it, 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 I get into, again, I get into my feelings when I do it. And I, I base, you know, the people that I choose, the whole piece that I do is totally based on my feelings. In other words, if I would um, if I would see you sitting in a restaurant and there's something something goes off in me, and uh, I would come up and I would ask you those questions: Could I take your picture? Could I do a portrait? And blah blah blah. But I, I I did it to all the people, and usually they were very nice, and I never took advantage of anybody. I never, 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 never did that. So. Uh, and I would create a scenario around them. Sometimes it was real, sometimes it wasn't. The girl at the Grandview Motel did not, she was not, you know, she was not a hustler at the Grandview Motel. She lived in the house with the lions, so, um, so anyway. So would you say that if someone came to you and said, hey, I want you to do a documentary about me, that you would be open to working with someone? Uh, yes, but it's got to have something that I'm interested in. So you might interview or screen people. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. Probably I would go, you know, I would, I would, you know, uh, approach the person myself, but it has to have something in me or something, something has to be there that makes me want to do it. I Obsessively want to do it. It's like strikes a nerve. Right, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Feelings, a feelings nerve. Yeah. I think um, I want to thank you for being so open with all those questions, but we yeah. have more for you. Um, I'm getting ready to open it up to questions from you. We have a microphone we're going to pass around, but we don't have a microphone. Oh, we can hear. Well, are we still but, on? Um, oh, the okay. point I need to bring up, too, is that when you do have a question, I'm going to repeat it back to Jim for people who are watching online. And so, with that, I'm looking for comments or questions you have for Jim. Rachel's got a question. So, when you were working in more in photography, you, your photography work seemed kind of like you staged or kind of created an environment for your subject. Can you talk a little bit about what that process of setting up your shot is like? Well, I usually use their stuff. In fact, most of the time I did use their stuff. And um, I would just, I would, you know, just use what they had and arrange it. Now, and, you know, hopefully it worked. There are a lot of times that I went back 
two, three, and four, and five times to get that picture right. I just didn't walk in and snap 30 photographs and out the door I went. Um, did you see the one where the woman is, has a doll with a bashed in head and the guy with the arm? That took me, that took me um, probably about five times to go back to each spending about three hours a time to get that right. And I couldn't get the guy's hook arm right. And I went to a, I went to a friend of mine, and I happened to, who is not an artist in any way, shape, or form, and I said to him, Rob, I said, I got this situation. I told him the situation. He said, just take the hand, put it underneath. And that worked. <laughs> okay, so, so and, but a lot of them, there's another one there with um, this fellow, and he's sitting in a kitchen chair, and he's got a Japanese wife, and she has her, her kimono. kimono on. That took, I think that took five times going back there to get that right. I that got was three worth dinners it. out of it, though. You got three? Five, three dinners. But, oh, uh, you did. but that, no, it, it, you know, so I have to go, sometimes I have to go back a lot to do it. There's another one there, this woman with a motorcycle, motor scooter in her living room. You see that one? She's a redhead woman. She's nope. got her motorcycle stuff on. We had, to, we had to bring that motorcycle in there, I think, three or four times to get that thing right. So that's, so it takes a long time to do them. That's a yeah. lot of work. Yeah, it is. For one I had a pusher, I had a friend of mine push the motorcycle, but uh, it's a, basically a motor scooter. But it does take a long time to do it. I mean, it just doesn't, you know, I just don't walk up there and do it and walk away. It's a lot of dedication. Yeah. But once I get in the, once I get in the mode, once I get, the, the click goes off, I don't stop until I get it. Do you feel the shift happen from like left brain to right brain when you're working? Or like a mental shift, like when you're in the zone? It's in the zone. What does it feel like? It's, the feelings are exploding. Okay, yeah. It's just, it's a wonderful feeling. It's just like, wow, it's, it's ecstasy. That's all right. Yeah. Chasing dark subject matter or dark things um, can turn to the, like ecstasy and feelings um, that feel really good like, in, throughout the process. Like what that's like. I'm going to restate the question for online, and the question was, how does chasing the dark side of life result in the good feelings? Is I think kind of what you said. Do you know how that's, it's kind of contradictory. Like the like, good feelings within me, right? Right, because you're, cre you're looking at the dark side of humanity and then you're getting a good high off of it. And I see now where that contradiction is. All right, I'll tell you how. There's, um, let's go back to the Monroe, Louisiana. And I'm, all right. Let's not go to Monroe, Louisiana, but there's, um, you read a lot of times these women are, are, are to beaten up a lot by their husbands, okay? And they seem to stay with the guy, all right? And uh, they, like, well, like the woman in Monroe, Louisiana, okay? And finally she got fed up with it. Usually people that either, either that example or any other you know, sort of dark behavioral example. You wonder, what, how, how can they possibly stay with this person? It's absolutely insane. Well, it is in a sense, but they've learned that behavior, okay? They've learned that behavior when they were kids, either being beat up themselves or they've been sexually molested. Okay, so that's, and they learn, they learn the behavior and they get to, in a sense, like or approve of the behavior. And that's, how, that's the whole dynamic of how all of that stuff happens. All right, so I've witnessed, I've been a part of some things, and so um, it, it just, it, it turns into art. I'm familiar with it. And I get, a, I, get, I get a sense of elation when I'm doing it, but I'm only assimilating it. It's my experience. Does that make sense to you? If it, do, if it doesn't, um, I guess it's, is it related to the subject matter being of a revenge nature, like somebody getting some sort of justice, um, or 
Yeah, I mean, you're talking about dark stuff, but it, I, I, yeah, I, get, I don't know. So, so am Eric, I doing revenge? Are you saying am I yeah, doing Eric revenge? Eric is, is asking. That. I guess I'm just trying to clarify. Uh, if there's a sense of justice yeah, from, exactly. from exposing that through art. You know, I can't answer that. It's, it's very plausible. It's very plausible. You have a really good point. I can tell you this. I can tell you this. Um, I know that when I when I did it in the video with the with the movie there, the movie match game, there's a part of me with the guys that do this. I, I'd like to beat their head in. I mean, I I have a real. Um, I don't have a tolerance for people like that because I've seen a lot of it. And so it's, that's, that's revenge when I'm doing that. But with the stuff in the, in the, in the videos, no, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, you may be right, that's an excellent point. I never what I heard a little bit was a channeling of some of that negative energy into the art yeah. and giving it a productive means to be expressed. Right. And then you said assimilating your experience, and so part of um, that pleasure could come from just telling your story and having it known. Just in whatever. But it's my, I can only do my experience. I can't, you know. So. Thank you. Oh. Thanks for the good question. Thanks for the question. Yeah, follow up question. I'm going to repeat the question. Okay. Or would you do? So the question is, if you're going to tackle documentary um, video or film, are you also oh, yeah. going to look for the dark side of human nature in that, in documentary? Yes, probably. It's, um, it, it'll, it'll, it'll probably have the same flavor as the pictures. The photographs are a lot more subtle, though, than the videos you're working on right now. They're right. totally different. They're um, apples and oranges. But I, but yeah, it's it's a part of me. I mean, I have to. Um, if if I if I if I did something, I think outside of my realm, at least at this point in my life, it would it would it would be miserable because I wouldn't have my heart in it. Have you ever done something where you didn't have your heart in it? Mm. Or started something? Uh, so, oh, I, I, did a, I did several weddings along the way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but they knew what they were going to get. They knew what they were getting. I mean, they were... Uh, what did they get? <laughs> I told them that it would be a recording that they were alive and got married and you could verify it, okay? <laughs> but I didn't charge very much for doing it either, so. But I can't, I can't, I, it's got to be a part of my personal experience. That's why I would, I, I've never, I've never made money off, I mean, other than the teaching, I've never made money off the photography because I would, I would be, it would just drive me crazy to have to you know, not do something because this is, what I do is very personal to me. So it it would it would drive me crazy to have to do something that um, that I didn't uh, that I didn't like doing because this is like as I say, it's really personal. has been to the final product, if you've ever had a subject that's been dissatisfied with what you created, um, and if you pay attention to their reaction, or if it's just not something that once a photograph is taken, it's, it's over kind of with them. I'm going to repeat that question, and that was, while you described your subjects being willing to have their photographs taken, was there any um, times where the person, after seeing the work, came back and had a problem or an issue with it? You know, I can't remember any. I, I don't think there have been. I, I've done a couple of, you know, people, you know, like they want a, a normal portrait taken of themselves and they've complained to me. But other than that, no. I, and, I, and I did, you know, the nice smiling picture, whatever, and they didn't like it. But I mean, no, no I haven't. I haven't. And I always tell them, this is, 
This is real life stuff that I'm doing. It's real life stuff. This is not a fantasy of you, okay? And 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 a lot of some instances, you know, I show them. I show them what I've done. But most of the time, I, I give them a I give them a you know a sales picture pitch without the picture. But nobody has come back and said that. Did they come and see their work when it was up? Like for instance, you had a show in Sun Valley or Ketchum. Right. right. Um, have they any of your subjects gone in those situations to look at the work? Well, I mean, they've seen the work. I've had you know some shows down here in Boise, and people have come and seen it. And there's there's one I did. It's called Wayne and Janice, and um, and they they came and uh, um, man, he's he's a um, authentic cowboy and his wife Janice, and they came. I had it was in the triennial, and, and boy, he had he came with his straw cowboy hat. And his, 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 his Wrangler jeans had creases in the pants, his shirt had creases, and boy, this was like one of the happiest days of his life. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, you, they, they like him. They usually like him. That's cool. Tell us about the um, Hollywood Market uh, oh. photograph, that famous uh, image of... Um, was it Margaret? Margaret. Margaret. So the question's about uh, the series of the Hollywood Market in North End, Boise, which is no longer in existence, sadly, but the owner was Margaret, and you spent time documenting her. Yeah, this is when I first, when I first came to Boise, and uh, I, um, she, she was one that I... I Bam! I just I made a connection with her instantly. So I asked her. I said, "Hey, Margaret, can I photograph you?" She said, "Yeah," and I, I got along really got along with her well, and um, I really I re I connected to her. There's something about her that I connected to. Now, does she open up to you though? Because if you haven't seen the images, um, and I had unfortunately never been to the Hollywood Market, there was a sign in the shop that always said like. We offer you our best, and then there was something about smiling. Happiness is spoken ha here. Happiness is spoken here. Right. Smiles will be returned, right. and then in every shot, Margaret is like deadpan, like no expression, no smile, no happiness. That was basically that. That was. I mean, she was a very friendly woman. She treated me graciously, and I. You know, I cannot say. I could not say. Enough, I cannot say enough good about her. But um, but basically that look was the look that she had. Yeah. I mean, she didn't go around you know happy and smiling and laughing and whatever around the store. Yeah. But she was she was as you saw her there in the photograph. Yeah. What was her reaction to those photographs? She loved them. That's cool. Yeah, she really loved them. We've got time for a couple more questions. What's five minutes? Five seconds or five minutes? It's minutes. Okay. Go ahead. So I, I get the theme that you're kind of driven by obsession or kind of compulsion when you get fired up on something. Yeah. Have you left a project unfinished that's just kind of eating at you? Uh, Questions about unfinished projects. I had one. Okay. And there was a guy down in um, in CUNA, uh, Slim's Auto Wreckage, and he had about five or six acres of cars. It was a, and uh, they were all old cars, and he lived in an abandoned schoolhouse. And I, that was an uncompleted one. He passed away. But I, I did a photograph that I, but I was never satisfied with it. So, but that's about the only one. Does that bother you that it's no left? No, the cars are no longer there. It's all no, no, it doesn't. I have another question, and I don't want to take anyone else's time, though, if there's another one. Uh, when we talked on Sunday, you talked about having a few mentors along the way, and I just wanted to know how those relationships were important to you. Well, when I was working for um, with 20th Century Fox, I, was, I lived in, and in fact, I still communicate with them. I lived in Albany, New York, and there was a guy up there named Art Lennig. And he was, he's probably the foremost scholar in silent movies. And, um, and he taught at the Univers uh, State University of New York in, in Albany. 
and I just, you know, it was like one of those serendipitous things, you, know, you meet the guy. And so I took uh, his film history course, I probably sat in on it maybe for three semesters, I just, just getting everything I can out of it. We became, you know, we became personal friends. And, you know, he was, taught me all about the silent movies, which I believe today are the greatest movies ever made. And so when, when seen on a, on, a, on a nice print and, you know, you have a good musical score to them and so on, but, I, but he, he taught me that and that was just, man, I was like, um, boy, I was like on Santa Claus' knee when I, we went through this like for three years. And then I came, uh, um, I, I went to another workshop with a guy named Fred Picker who was very instrumental in my in my growth in photography, and then I came to uh, I had another guy in New Orleans help me, and he he was a pr black and white printer because I worked mostly in black and white. He was a black and white printer, and he helped me learn how to you know make prints. And then at Boise State here, there was the guy, a guy here that his name was Brent Smith. He's no longer here, and he was one of the most wonderful teachers I've ever had in my life. Did you ever get a chance to tell him that? Oh yeah. Oh good. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so I've had some, I've been very fortunate. I mean, I've been really, really very fortunate. So. Well, with that, I think that I'm going to point out that uh, the Boise City Arts and History Department has created a very cool zine. And this is the first edition of the zine. Uh, let's see what page Jim is on. This has 12 artists for 12 months that we're going to feature here at the James Castle House throughout the year. At 650, you can get it in the James Castle House General Store. And um, it's got excerpts and the photos from their original interviews on the blog. So I just want to thank you, Jim, first for being uh, here and being so great. honest and being so accessible to us and for everyone who was able to come and everybody who tuned in and hopefully We'll get to see you next month on February 28th with Chris Binion in the, that chair. So. Can I say something? Of course, I want to thank I want to thank you guys coming. Yeah. Because, you know, you're 50% of it here, so yeah, thanks a lot yeah, for coming. Yeah, thank you. All right.